Hi, everybody, and welcome to Skeptics in the Pub Online. I'm Dave, and I'll be your host tonight. Skeptics in the Pub Online was born out of the pandemic when we couldn't do our regular talks in pubs, and we've been here every week since. We decided that this is going to be our last weekly talk as we're now going to move to every other week from this week, but we will continue to have our virtual pub open every week. If you like what we're doing, then please make a donation at sitp.online slash donate, and I'm sure our lovely mods will have put the link into the chat for you. We'll be following our normal format, the talk, followed by a break and then a Q&A. And if you'd like to ask or vote for your favourite questions, please head over to sitp.online slash ask. Tonight's speaker is Professor Stefan Lewandowski. He is a cognitive scientist at the University of Bristol. He was an Australian professorial fellow from 2007 to 2012 and was awarded a Discovery Outstanding Researcher Award from the Australian Research Council in 2011. Held a Reves Visiting Professorship at the University of Amsterdam in 2012 and received a Wolfson Research Merit Fellowship from the Royal Society upon moving to the UK in 2013. He was appointed a Fellow of the Academy of Social Science and a Fellow of the Association of Psychological Research uh, Science sorry, in 2017. And in 2016, he was appointed a Fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry for his commitment to science, rational inquiry and public education. His research uh, examines people's memory, decision making and knowledge structures with a particular emphasis on how people update their memories. If information they believe and if if memories they believe turn out to be false. This has led to him to examine the persistence of misinformation and the spread of fake news in society, including conspiracy theories. He's particularly interested in the variables that determine whether or not people accept scientific evidence, for example, surrounding vaccinations or climate science. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Professor Stefan Lewandowski. Wow, thank you for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> And I look forward to the break because then I can crack a beer and be in the pub for real. But until we get there, I want to tell you something about uh, fake news. And everybody talks about fake news. And I talk about dementors uh, on top of that. What are dementors? Well, for those of you who haven't read Harry Potter recently, there are these sort of invisible things that suck intelligence out of the people around them, basically. And... The argument I want to make is that a lot of the problems we're facing in today's societies are caused by, well, not the mentors, but processes and infrastructure and people who act like the mentors. And to put this into context, I'm going to first tell you a little bit about the history of lies. Now, <clears throat> this is a very selective history, and I'm focusing on American presidents because um, well, we know a lot about them, and when they do lie, they tend to get caught out, and there tends to be a scandal. So we learn a lot of things about uh, American presidents and their relationship to the truth. And so here we go. In 1970, you know, Richard Nixon lied about Watergate. Then we had Ronald Reagan and Iran Contra, Bill Clinton and his Picadillos with interns. Then we had George Bush and the weapons of mass destruction. And then we had Donald Trump, who just lied, basically. Um, how much did he lie? Well, he made 30,000, more than 30,000 false and misleading claims during his presidency, uh, which is equivalent to 21 per day. Now, that alone, I think, puts him, sets him apart from his predecessors and many other politicians. Um, but it isn't just that there is an increased quantity of misinformation out in public life now. What I also think has happened, and I think that's a much more important aspect of it, is that there's been a shift of the type of lies or misstatements or false claims uh, that we, we're encountering. Now, I would argue that in you know prior to, let's say, 2010 or 2015, whatever your cutoff is, politicians... You know, they sometimes were challenged by the truth and they then kind of tried to get out of accountability by lying about it. You know, it made perfect sense. Richard Nixon didn't want to go to jail over Watergate. Bill Clinton didn't want to get caught out with this intern, so he lied about it. George Bush carefully curated together with Tony Blair 
the story about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, which we now know was based on uh, willful manipulation and, and deception. But in all those cases, none of these people questioned the existence of the Watergate building or the existence of Iraq. They were contesting a reality, a shared reality with false information. They made claims that they wanted us to believe as being the truth about reality. Now, however you might feel about that, that is qualitatively different, in my opinion, from what we're observing now, which has been called shock and chaos disinformation, and which I think of as epistemic insouciance. That's just a fancy way of saying no one gives a damn about truth. And where, where now I think the objective is not even to get people to believe anything. Sometimes Donald Trump during his presidency was saying things that had no apparent purpose that anybody could discover. I mean, you know, he was just lying about stuff and it was very clear he was lying. But why would he do that? And whenever he did, and people uh, challenged him on this, which in the United States, to their credit, the media did, unlike some other country, such as the UK, but let's not talk about that. Um, whenever he was challenged on that, the response was not a defense of this perception of reality. Instead, it was... Um, what I call, what other people have called, ontological gerrymandering. What do we mean by that? What we mean by that is it was just a redefinition of the concept of facts and truth. So you don't like my facts, I make up my own alternative facts. Truth isn't truth, fact, oh, don't bother me. That's an antiquated impression. We're much more modern. We know that one man's fact is another man's lie. So there is this shock and chaos constant blizzard the false information that is undermining not our belief in specific aspects of reality, but it's undermining our, our belief in the fact that truth might even exist. It is undermining truth itself, the notion of truth. I think that's a profound shift of what politicians used to do uh, compared to what some of them are doing now. And they do so without any apparent political cost. These are Trump's approval ratings um, over the four years of his presidency, and they're basically flat. They're not spectacular, but they're pretty good, and they're flat. And at no point did he lose support among his own party. At, at the very least, 77% of Republicans approved of his job performance, and around 75% of Republicans considered Trump to be honest at various points throughout his presidency as revealed by opinion polls. Not just one, but several, and at different times in his presidency. So that, I think, is a stable, relatively stable number, and it is one that should give us pause for thought, because, wait a minute, Donald Trump being honest, given what the fact checkers say, what's going on here? Now, I think that to understand this, it is very helpful to go back to the 1950s and 1960s when philosophers analyzed Nazism and Stalinism and other forms of totalitarianism and see what they have to say. And one of the illuminating but also quite concerning things you then discover is that what they have to say about totalitarianism is pretty much what I would argue we're experiencing now. And that is that shock and chaos, disinformation, destabilizes institutions and ultimately facilitates authoritarianism. Because I don't really have time to get into this in great detail, but the, the claim I would like to make, the foundational claim is that you cannot have a democracy without acknowledging the existence of truth and the importance of evidence and facts to discern between good and bad ideas. The moment you lose that, well, I'm sorry to say, you're at risk of losing democracy. How did we get here? Well, 
there's lots that can be said about that. I want to focus on three what I call knowledge dementors or processes, people or processes by which this type of thing we're experiencing now uh, could have happened. Now, let's start out talking about conspiracy theories. Uh, conspiracy theories are a wonderful topic. Everybody is really kind of, you know, fascinated by that. And sometimes it's sort of funny. Um, but at other times, it's also very serious. And it is serious when uh, denial of scientific facts is wrapped up in a conspiracy theory, as shown by these two examples here. The tweeter in chief uh, declaring that global warming is a hoax. Um, and the problem with that is not just that the leader of the United States believed that, but that there is a fallout from conspiracy theories. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that even people who don't believe in conspiracy theories change their intentions when being exposed to one. So there's a study done here by colleagues. These are both in, in Britain um, at the University of Kent. They showed that exposure to conspiracy theories decreases people's intention to reduce their carbon footprint or to engage in politics. Um, in fact, exposure to conspiratorial claims can even decrease trust in government institutions, even those that are unconnected to whatever conspiracy you might tell people about. So to illustrate, if I tell you about a conspiracy involving the unemployment rate and how that is computed to favor the government, whatever it may be, then as a result of being exposed to that, you may lose trust in your local public library, which has nothing to do with the unemployment statistics, but there seems to be a general decline in trust. So conspiracy theories are necessarily harmless at all. Now, um, it is therefore important to understand how people get there. How do people, why do people believe in conspiracy theories and why do they articulate? Well, um, I would argue that there are two ways in which this can happen. On the one hand, and this has been researched widely and we know this pretty well, uh, some people are just prone to believe conspiracy theories. And we can predict who those people are on the basis of their personality variables, on the basis of their socioeconomic status, education, person, you know, a couple of things. We have a pretty good handle on, on uh, anticipating who might be susceptible to a conspiracy theory. Now, the second route, which people haven't looked at much at all, um, is that people may deploy conspiratorial rhetoric in response to a threat to their worldview, that is to their personal ideologies, their beliefs about how the world should operate. Now, to explain this, let me tell you about a study I just published a few months ago, where I departed from the known fact that free market endorsement predicts rejection of climate science. The more people are extreme believers in unregulated free markets, the less likely they are to accept that climate change is happening and that we have the science uh, to support that. Now, um, I made use of this pervasive association, which I'm illustrating here just graphically. This is a 24 country survey and uh, you get these strong effects pretty much everywhere, but they're strongest in the US. And if you take English speaking nations, they're, they're, they're also very strong. If you go across 24 nations, as you can see in the graphs here, there's still an effect, anything to the vertical um, dashed line, anything to the right is an effect that associates conservatism and free market endorsement with the rejection of climate science. So this is robust and replicable, and countless studies are showing that. Um, now, why, why does that matter? How does that link back to conspiracy theories? Well, let me explain how I think we can connect the two. One of the things about climate change, of course, is that um, there is overwhelming scientific evidence, and 
if you take the scientific evidence seriously, then we have to do something about the problem. We have to engage in mitigation. Now, however you do that, it'll mean interfering with business as usual as we're doing it right now. It just can't be done any other way. Uh, you got to put a price on carbon, you got to have regulations, you got to increase the price of petrol, whatever you do, something will have to change. Now, that in turn is perceived as a threat by some people to their, not just their life and their money, but I think more importantly to their deeply held beliefs about the free market. Now, if that belief is being challenged by strong evidence that is supported by virtually all climate scientists, this number 97%, I think is a lower bound. By now, it's probably higher. It's about 99%. If all the scientists agree on the basis of evaluating the evidence, how are you going to get out of this conflict if your worldview is challenged? Well, one way to do it is to say, aha, aha, all the scientists agree, sure. Of course they do. That's because they want to create the world government. They're all liberals. They're all in it together. And bang, the moment you say that, you can dismiss all the evidence. So cooking up this conspiracy theory in response to, to a threat to your worldview is a get out of jail for free card. And what I want to show you next is the experiment where I showed that to be the case, arguably. I think, you know, the data are pretty interesting in that card. What I did was to ask people about their view on the scientific consensus um, in, in three different domains. The link between HIV and AIDS, which, of course, is beyond dispute, beyond scientific dispute. The link between CO2 and climate change, which is also not scientifically disputed, and then vaccinations that they protect you against diseases, which is also not disputed by any medical uh, research. So I would ask people, out of 100 climate scientists or 100 medical scientists, how many do you think believe that CO2 causes climate change? So I got people's impression of the consensus. I then told the participants in the experiment that actually there is a consensus. Virtually all medical scientists agree on HIV causing AIDS, or I said the same about climate change and vaccinations, all three in all three cases. And I then asked the participants to tell me why that is the case. And I gave them these options to choose from, and they could sort of weight each of these options using a slider bar. Uh, as you can see, some of them are hinting at a conspiracy. I mean, like funding availability, groupthink, you know, suppressing dissent. They're, they're suppressing these dissenting heroes, these, these minority scientists employed by the fossil fuel industry, coincidentally, who know so much more about climate change than anybody else. So I was hinting at these conspiracy things and um, I was interested in how people would choose the various presumed causes for the consensus as a function of their political views. So the question now is, how do political views predict the presumed reasons for a scientific consensus? This is where things get to be interesting. I'm going to show you two graphs. They're both um, you know, a little bit complicated, so let me, let me explain them and walk you through. What I'm showing you here are correlations, the association between conservatism and what people thought the reason was for a scientific consensus. Now, a correlation is just a measure of how much these two things go together statistically. And anything in gray is not significant. That means there's no statistical association. And you can see instantly that for AIDS and HIV, politics plays no role. It is not politicized at all. Makes no difference. Okay, what about climate change? Whoa, all hell breaks loose. Now, these are the same people. You got to bear that in mind. The same people with the same politics just responding to a different question about climate change. And now all of a sudden, look what happens. There's a strong correlation between conservatism and endorsement 
of these conspiratorial reasons for the consensus and a negative association for the one explanation for the consensus that actually acknowledges the role of evidence. So what that means is that the more conservative people are, the less likely they think the consensus arose from evaluation of the evidence. And the more they think instead that it came out of these mysterious processes, such as groupthink or scientists chasing the funding and all these other things you find on climate denialist blogs, a huge uh, effect in terms of how that is being pulled apart. Vaccinations, <coughs> similar, but not identical. So conservatism matters, as it does in attitudes towards conversations. The more conservative people are, the less likely they are to get vaccinated right now in the United States. <clears throat> um, and again, the more conservative people endorsed more conspiratorial reasons and less evidence-based reasons, although the, the strength of this effect wasn't nearly as large as it was for climate change. And now I'm showing you the same data again, same people. But now I'm looking at the association between conspiracism, between their dispositional tendency to engage in conspiracy theorizing, which I also measured through a uh, survey instrument. <clears throat> so I'm looking at the association between conspiracism and the presumed reason for the consensus. And now the pattern is very different. All of a sudden, this dispositional stuff no longer matters that much for climate change. Doesn't matter how much people tend to believe in conspiracy theories, that is driving their attitudes towards climate change a little, but not a hell of a lot. Vaccinations, on the other hand, wow, you get a big effect. It really, really matters whether you tend to believe in conspiracy theories. And that is also well known. Anti-vaxxers, by and large, you scratch the surface and there'll be a conspiracy there in no time at all. And even for AIDS, it pops out. So all of a sudden, we have a differentiation now between the disposition to engage in conspiracy theories and the politically motivated deployment of a conspiracy theory to explain away an inconvenient consensus. So I would argue that there is such thing as pragmatic deployment of conspiracy theories, which is to say that in order not to be bothered with threatening evidence, people resort to conspiracy theory and say, ah, yeah, the scientists, you know, they want to have a world government. Okay, done. I can fly to Bali on my holiday. Um, now, the good news in this is that countermeasures are much easier for those people than they are for dispositional conspiracy theorists, the sort of proverbial crowd that are totally committed to, to their cause. And just in case you're interested, I wrote a public facing handbook that's now available in, I don't know, 10 languages by now uh, on conspiracy theories and how to deal with them. And you can download them at the link, which I believe is being put in the chat as we speak. Right. So that's one of our Dementor processes we got to deal with the creation and the belief in conspiracy theories. Um, now, the other thing we got to ask is how do the media handle shock and chaos? How do they deal with, um, well, with uh, lies, misdirections, deceptions by leading politicians? Now, this is an interesting question to ask because the conventional wisdom suggests that the media, certainly in the United States, are principal agents of agenda setting. They set the political agenda for decades. And the politicians kind of tried to ride this out and sort of, you know, shaped it a little, but they didn't have the, the, the utmost power in setting the agenda. That seems to be a fairly consistent finding from the literature for a long time until social media came along and until Trump, the tweeter in chief, was able to set the agenda. Now, to show this, um, I want to remind those of you who have a very good memory of the fact that before he even assumed office in late uh, 2016, I guess, 
um, Trump tweeted very angrily against the cast of a Broadway play, which at the end of a live performance that was attended by Vice President-elect Pence, they, they pleaded for a diverse and united America because they were terribly concerned about what Trump might do to the country. <laughs> they weren't wrong, were they? Um, and Donald Trump got very uh, excited about that. And, um, you know, this is just two out of a dozen tweets in which he accused the Broadway production of harassing the vice president and all that. Now, that um, had an effect on public opinion or public interest. How do we know that? Well, we know that by looking at Google Trends data. What I'm showing you here is the number of Google searches conducted in the United States over a sort of nine months period um, where people searched Google for Trump Hamilton. Those are the two keywords. And wow, there was a huge spike when, when that tweet fest broke out. And it went on for a few days afterwards, but gee, you know, there was a lot of talk about it. Now, you may notice that that graph also contains another line, a blue line, which had a little blip, but not much. Now, that blue line, it turns out, was for Google searches for the keywords Trump University Settlement. On the day of his Twitter campaign, he settled a lawsuit for $25 million uh, for fraud against his so-called Trump University, which included a $1 million penalty, by the way. So there was some admission of misconduct here. Otherwise, you don't pay that penalty, you would think. Uh, and look at public interest in that. There wasn't any. And who remembers that lawsuit now? I don't know. I mean, I do, but, you know, probably very few people do. So back then, we thought, gee, this is really fascinating. What's going on here? Is there something systematic going on? So in this paper I now want to tell you about, which we uh, published last year sometime, um, we, we tried to be more systematic about this and, and design this sort of conceptual model of what it would look like if Donald Trump used Twitter to distract everybody's attention from something he didn't like. So he tweets about Broadway to distract from his lawsuit. Could that actually be happening? Well, it could, and we postulated that if that were the case, then every time the media covers something that he doesn't like, Trump would start tweeting more about something. And then if that's successfully diverting attention, the media might drop the harmful issue the next day. And the plus and minus here indicates the expected direction of this relationship, if, if it exists. Now, in the study on our tell you about, we operationalized this by um, looking at the coverage of Russia and Mueller, the investigation that was sort of overshadowing the first two years of Trump's presidency. We determined that the president's strengths, the political strengths pre-pandemic were jobs, the economy, China, his, his tough stance against China, North Korea, and then, of course, his whole immigration thing, the wall. And we postulated that if he starts tweeting about his strengths, maybe the media will then drop the issue uh, the next day. How did we do this? Well, this was done through a big data analysis by scraping the content of all of the New York Times, ABC News segments. This is the nightly most centrist news broadcast uh, in the United States. And, of course, all of Donald Trump's tweets. And we related the coverage in the media to tweet content, focusing initially only on the tweets about China, jobs, immigration, his political strengths. So first question to ask is, do Donald Trump's tweets divert? Now, these numbers are very small. You can't see them, so I make them bigger. And guess what? They're all positive and they have stars next to them. That means they're statistically significant. Incidentally, after including about 100 control variables to you know, control for all sorts of other things that might cause the effect. What that means is that the more the New York Times talks about Russia and Mueller or the more ABC News does, 
the more Donald Trump tweets about jobs, China, immigration, his personal uh, strengths. And the next question we asked is, okay, now does this work? And to answer that question, we're relating yesterday's tweets about those diversionary topics that we presumed he would tweet about to the New York Times coverage the next day. So from yesterday to today or from today to tomorrow, but because there's a lag in what the media do, it was always overnight. And what did we find? We found negative numbers meaning that the more Donald Trump tweeted about his strengths, the less the media the next day covered Russia and Mueller. Now, um, that worked for two of the keywords, but not the other one. And it was sort of a weak effect. It wasn't huge. It wasn't statistically large. It was significant. But So that means probably not due to chance, maybe. Um, but it was small. So we wanted to extend this and go and expand this to cover the entire Twitter vocabulary by uh, Donald Trump. So we looked at everything he tweeted about. And we said, well, <laughs> what does Trump do when uh, uh, the New York Times talks about Russia and Mueller? And so I'm going to show you two graphs, but I have to explain the graphs first so you understand what they're plotting. And they're kind of funky you know, nice look at graphs. Um, so what we did for each possible pair of words in Donald Trump's tweets, we established a statistical relationship with coverage of the New York Times or ABC News on Russia and Mueller. Now, that statistical relationship we plotted on the x-axis. We then established another statistical relationship for precisely the same pair between uh, the number of times that word pair appeared and coverage of the New York Times the next day. And that means for each word pair, we now have a point in space. Um, and the point in space is determined by its statistical relationship as a function of Russia and Mueller coverage before and after. So each possible tweeted pair has a location in space. Now, if there's no relationship, then we should just have a blob of points in the middle around zero. Zero means nothing is going on. And they're kind of like a thousand or so of these word pairs because there are that many different ways in which Donald Trump could be tweeting a pair of words. So if there's nothing happening, it's all a blob in the middle. If um, and we would expect that, of course, for neutral items, as I'll show you in a moment. Now, if Donald Trump is attempting to divert from Russia Mueller, then that point cloud should shift over to the right. That means he's tweeting excitedly more and more in response to uh, the coverage he doesn't like. And if that is successful in diverting attention, then the point cloud shouldn't just be to the right, it should also be low because low below zero means less coverage the next day in the media. So that, bear that in mind for interpretation of the graphs I'm gonna show you now. These are now the actual data. Now I'm gonna start out with neutral stuff. We looked at coverage for the economy, football, gardening, skiing. I mean, you know, when you get to gardening, you can probably think, well, how does that concern Donald Trump? Well, as you can see from the graph, it doesn't. Uh, whenever the New York Times talks about gardening, doesn't matter how much, he, he, nothing happens. He sits within this blob in the middle, which means there's nothing interesting going on. The same is true for skiing and football and the economy and lots of other stuff we looked at. So as you would expect, if nothing is happening, nothing is happening. The blob is in the middle. The tweets are not related to media coverage or vice versa. Now, what about Russia and Mueller? Well, here is a graph that looks a little broken up here, but looks perfectly fine in my PowerPoint. I don't know what you're seeing. I see it slightly broken up, but the next one makes it look good again. Um, here, all of a sudden, 
we're seeing this massive cluster of points in the bottom right quadrant. Something is happening here. And the bottom right quadrant outside these red lines, those are significant effects. That means there's a whole bunch of words Donald Trump will start tweeting in response to Russian Mueller coverage. And the next day, in response to those tweets, the New York Times will reduce their coverage of Russian Mueller. And precisely the same we observe for the ABC news headlines. There's again a cluster of points on the bottom right that didn't exist for any of these other topics. So something specifically is going on here. Donald Trump is being triggered by stuff he doesn't like, and the media are seemingly responsive to that. Now, to illustrate what I'm talking about, and I'll see how this is going to work, um, if the New York Times talks about Russia and Mueller, the word cloud on the left is precisely the words they actually used in their news coverage. Then Donald Trump tweets about the words on the right. Those then show up significantly more in his tweets than they would otherwise. And so we have a relationship where the coverage on the left is increasing his tweeting on the right. And then the next day, that increase of tweeting about those key words, job, jobs, tax, North Korea, et cetera, et cetera, is reducing coverage in the New York Times of the initial topic that Donald Trump didn't like. Now, this little animation here is exaggerating the size of the effect. It's a caricature to visualize what's going on. But statistically, it is significant, even though the effects are small. And they show up with the New York Times and with the ABC. So basically, diversion works. Donald Trump played the media like a piano. And, well, we don't know if he did that consciously or by intuition or whether it was coincidental. Um, we don't know that. But statistically, the effect is there. And it is pretty robust given how many other variables we stuck in there to, to control for potential other variables. So that's my second example of a knowledge dementor. Now let me turn to the last one. We now have to talk about Facebook. Now, a couple of things that should worry you in this world, and I haven't mentioned them yet. I mean, the, the stuff we talked about so far, that was sort of just the warm-up act, so to speak. Why do we have to worry about Facebook? Well, I think we have to worry about it because your data on Facebook, your likes and everything you, you do on Facebook is extremely powerful. Powerful for others to infer things about you that you probably, maybe, perhaps don't want to know. For example, if you leave 300 likes, and it doesn't matter what you like, so long as you leave a lot of likes on Facebook over time, you know, in a year or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, a machine learning algorithm can infer your personality better than your own spouse. This is based on data that were published by you, you at all, uh, five or six years ago. And even just 10 or 20 likes is enough for the machine to do better than work colleagues. Okay, so your personality, in other words, who you are, is knowable to people who have access to those data. Um, now, the moment they have those data, what they can do is they can target you with advertising on the basis of your personality. And that may be okay sometimes, but when it comes to political manipulation, I would argue that's problematic. So, but does this actually work? Well, I think there's pretty good evidence that it does work. Here's a study by Matt et al. published a few years ago uh, where they conducted a study on Facebook exploiting this known relationship between likes and people's personality. And they targeted ads for cosmetics to women, only women because it was cosmetics, um, that were targeted on the basis of whether they were extroverts or introverts. And the ads were designed to be particularly appealing 
either to introverts or extroverts. I'll explain in a moment what an introvert and an extrovert is. Um, you can take your own guess now. Look at those two ads. One on the left, that be an extrovert, an outgoing person. The one on the right, might that be an introvert, somebody who's sort of more, you know, happy in themselves, eating books and so on? Well, yeah. <laughs> the ad on the left was designed to appeal to extroverts. The one on the right was designed to appeal to introverts. And in this experiment, they targeted both types of audiences with both types of ads. They fully crossed it. They crossed it over. And what they found is shown in the data here, that um, when the audience and the ad were matched, they sold more cosmetics. These are actual conversion rates. They actually sold stuff in this experiment. And they made more money if they sent extrovert ads to an extroverted audience or introverted ads to an introverted audience, but not when they they were crossed over. So there's pretty good evidence here, I think, that targeted advertising works. And it's by far not the only study showing that. And indeed, Facebook owns a patent for using and for a personality for targeting. It's public knowledge. It's out there. It says, oh, we will use this to target messages and ads. Now, that, to my mind, is problematic because if you do that in a political context, and you're targeting people's vulnerabilities based on your knowledge of their personality, then you no longer have political discourse. You have manipulation. And it's particularly worrisome that this manipulation takes place without knowledge of a political opponent. Uh, no one but the target and the person sending the message knows of the existence of this dark ad. So how is a political opponent going to rebut misinformation about them that they don't even know exists because it's only sent to people of a cer certain personality type who live in a certain postcode? Um, so I th personally think, together with a lot of other people, that dark ads are a serious problem to democracy because they are completely antithetical to this idea of having a democratic debate where the public chooses which argument they find most convincing. And if you really want to get into this uh, arena, I would recommend another report I was responsible for uh, late last year for the European Commission, where we examined the entire relationship between technology and democracy uh, through a lens of cognitive science, trying to understand this tension uh, on the basis of cognitive science. And one of the things we recommend in that report is, of course, that we have to have some sort of regulation or some sort of change in the approach to social media, not censorship, oh no, but some other clever ways of dealing with these problems. But of course, that'll take years. So what are we going to do in the meantime? Well, my last experiment, a few more minutes that I want to tell you about is winding its way to publication now, hopefully very quickly. Uh, where what we did was to reverse engineer micro-targeting. That is, what we tried to do was to boost people's knowledge about themselves by telling them something about their personality to then see if that might enable them to detect when they're being targeted. So the experiment was really quite simple. We took a whole bunch of uh, people from... I think the United Kingdom in this case, uh, from an online panel. Um, we measured their personality uh, in the critical condition up front. We gave them feedback on the introversion, extroversion dimension. And we then asked them to classify ads and tell us whether or not they thought the ads were targeting them. Now, we did this in the condition on the left where people have gotten feedback on the relevant personality dimension. And we also did it in a control condition where they have the same task, but the, the personality quote unquote thing we asked them about up front was completely irrelevant. That's something to do with affinity for technology, whatever that is. We didn't really care much. It was just something to 
to keep them occupied. Um, now, the important thing in this experiment is that we provided people with an explanation of what extroversion, introversion means, first of all. And we said something like this, extroverts kind of outgoing, engaged with the external world. Introverts are more quiet and withdrawn. Um, people read more than just these thumbnails. It was sort of a you know, lengthy text that really explained it in some detail. And then um, they were given personalized feedback. So somebody who had just scored as an extrovert on the personality question two minutes earlier, we analyzed it online. They were given feedback. Um, oh, look here, you're an extrovert. And more than 74 people of your age are actually less extroverted than you, and only you know a few are more extroverted. So they were given information about their own personality. That was accurate. Um, and this is what an introvert might have gotten. Oh, wow, you're more introverted than 98 people of your age, only 98 out of 100. Um, only two people are even more introverted. You know? So that was the feedback that people got. And here was the experimental task. Take the ads that we know work for extroverts and introverts from the previous study, classify them. Just tell me, hey, do you think this is targeted at you? Yes or no? That's all people have to do. Um, and when we now look at the data, what we find is this. People in the control condition who were not given any feedback, they were doing okay. You know, they were like at 60% accuracy, and that was above chance. So it wasn't just random clicks of the button. But, I mean, you know, it wasn't perfect either. After the personality feedback, that jumped to 90% accuracy. In fact, the modal response, that means the most frequent performance level of everybody in that condition was 100% accurate. I mean, that is an amazingly strong effect as they come in behavioral sciences. The boost of 30% just through that personality feedback. So the good news from this experiment is that, yes, apparently we can train people to uh, recognize when they're being targeted, at least in the context of, yeah, cosmetic ads. Can we also do this for political messages? Well, we don't know yet, but we're working on it as we speak. So watch the space for more in the year or so. Right, and that brings me to the end of what I wanted to tell you about, which is uh, three different ways in which what I call the knowledge dementors are spreading disinformation potentially or diverting attention and are contributing to a arguably what I would think is a, is a notable threat to our democracy. So thank you very much for that. And that's the end. Thank you so much, Stefan. That was absolutely fantastic. I absolutely love that. Uh, we're now going to take a 15 minute break or so uh, for you to recharge your glasses. Uh, but if you have time, you could check out our Discord server, which you can find at sitp.online slash contact. And don't forget to ask or like your favorite questions at sitp.online slash ask. Remember that we're we'll moving to talks every other week, so there will not be a talk next week. But the week after that, we will have Dr. Mohammed Samid from CERN speaking for us. So we will now take a break. So we're back at five past. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Um, we are back with Stefan Lewandowski for our Q&A uh, following the talk. So um, we'll get straight into the Q&A um, with a question from Cleo, who asks, which do you think comes first? Uh, uh, conservative political views or science denial slash conspiracist attitudes, which way do you think the correlation works? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I think uh, probably it is from conservatism to science denial rather than the other way around. Um, now, the reason I think that is because of a paper that uh, I didn't talk about, but that just came out a few weeks ago where we looked at... Um, 
the relationship between conservatism and people's attitudes towards the norms of science. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the scientific enterprise is, is conducted according to a set of sort of tacitly accepted rules or norms. And they were established in the 1940s. There's a famous sociologist by the name of Merton who looked at the scientific enterprise, analyzed it, and came up with these norms. <clears throat> and what are those norms? Well, uh, one of them is called communism. Now, that's not a good word to begin with if you're conservative. And of course, he doesn't talk about communism as in you know, the Soviet Union. He talks about communism as being the fact that scientific knowledge is communal. It is open to anyone. And that is pretty much true. If I publish a paper, I don't, you know, it's, it's public. It's the knowledge I generate is owned, you know, by everyone, by the entire world. Uh, and the second norm is called uh, disinterestedness. So that's the idea that scientists should not derive a profit from what they do. They should not be uh, paid to find a particular thing. They should find whatever the evidence dictates. Um, and, and it goes on, the list goes on. It's also uh, non-discriminatory, it is internationalist. You know, science has all sorts of attributes that if you, if you analyze them and compare them to conservative thought, then, um, you know, there is a clash there. It's kind of like, really? <laughs> oh, that doesn't work too well. And that's precisely what we found in this study, that conservatives, even before you ask them any, any attitudes, um, uh, towards scientific issues, they have difficulty endorsing the norms of science. And that's why I think, um, in, to anticipate another question that's lower down in Slido, until now, I have not been able to find any science denial on the political left. I have been looking. Um, Pretty interesting. Lots of different not at all. Not at all, not statistically. Now, you have to be careful in, in, in interpreting what I say. What I, when I say that, I'm talking about large representative samples of um, usually the, the United States, because that's just the easiest place to get participants. And it's also the one that, in a sense, matters the most when it comes to global action and climate change. So <clears throat> if you get a thousand Americans, you will not get an association between any sort of science denial and left-wing politics. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, there isn't some left-wing, you know, radical somewhere <laughs> who's denying vaccine. Of course not. You know, there are climate deniers on the left. There are they're, uh, vaccine deniers on the left. They're, there's all sorts of people on the left who are, you know, uh, denying everything. I can even think of people in the in Britain, who are, who are quite prominent on the left and are brothers of opposition leaders, for example, who, who <laughs> now deny a lot of things, but they don't show up if you do the statistical work. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we've on to a question from Igor, um, who asks, um, so how do we fix humanity? What's the best thing we can do to help people tell and believe less lies? Uh, you know, we like the easy questions here. Yeah, that's how do we fix humanity, isn't it? Well, uh, First of all, I, I don't think we have to fix humanity. Um, I think people are just fine, actually. What we have to fix is <clears throat> the interaction between humanity and, and how we think and the environment that we find ourselves in. And so let me, let me illustrate that with, again, Facebook. And by the way, I'm not bashing Facebook any more than I have to. It, it is just, you know, one of the... Uh, uh, very important platforms. And Facebook is driven by selling your attention to advertisers. And so is YouTube. The only reason anything is free online is because you're the product. When you're using something that's free, you're being sold. And you're being sold to advertisers. Now, that's extremely important to understand, I think, because what that means is that there is a commercial imperative for the platforms to keep you online as long as possible. How do you capture people's attention? Well, we know from decades of research that people are attracted to things that are novel, that are emotional, and usually a negative emotion, that are out outrage provoking, anger provoking, that make you fearful. Now that sounds awful, but in actual fact, 
people do pay attention for good reason to things that are scary. Well, we had to because if the mammoth was going after us, it was pretty a pretty valuable survival skill to pay attention to that guy and run like mad in the Stone Age. And so we, you know, we have this whole attentional apparatus that is geared towards biasing frightening things and novel things. And Facebook is now turning that into money. So if you think about that, well, of course we're drenched in false information because fake news, by definition, you can make up. So if you know how human attention works, what are you going to make up? You're going to make up stuff that's novel and outrage provoking and that gets people excited and agitated and angry and they hate each other. Well, <laughs> no surprises here. This is the attention economy at work. So what we have to fix isn't human beings. What we have to fix is the interaction between our attentional biases and what the platforms are doing. And we have to say, well, hang on, guys. Actually, you cannot make money out of polarizing people and getting them to hate each other. You got to find a different business model. You see it a lot on YouTube and especially where it starts off quite innocuous. And each time you click on the next video, it becomes more less and less innocuous and becomes more and more down that scary rabbit hole of uh, absolutely. Yes. Um, OK, we'll move on to another question from Anonymous, which is kind of related to that previous question, which is, is there any way that we can vaccinate people against the knowledge dementors? <laughs> yeah, excellent, excellent question. And, and, and custom made for me because uh, the answer is yes, it's called inoculation. And um, one of my research programs deals with precisely that issue, trying to inoculate people against misinformation and conspiracy theories. And I'm working with people at Cambridge, Sander van der Linden and John Rosenbeck, whom you may have heard of. I was just about to mention his pre-bunking. Um, there you go, pre-bunking inoculation. Yep. Um, that is what uh, I work on. The debunking handbook that we published last year, I think I put a link in the chat. Which I was about to say, please, Mods, can you pop that in the chat? It is a fantastic yeah, resource. Yeah, um, that talks a lot about inoculation. And the basic idea behind inoculation is that you tell people ahead of time how they will be misled. Now, what's interesting about that is that you don't have to know what they're being exposed to ahead of time. Uh, what you have to know ahead of time is how they will be misled. So, in other words, we, we just finished a series of five experiments where we uh, showed people very brief videos under two minutes that told them how they could be manipulated online. And after watching the video, people became more discerning of social media posts that were manipulating them versus those that weren't. And so <clears throat> I think there, there is a good opportunity there for an intervention that can be scaled up to train people to become more resistant. Um, the only footnote to this that I have to add is um, that we got to be careful we don't offload the whole problem only on the user. This is not a problem of the user. It's a problem of the interaction between human beings and the online architecture. And if we just say, oh, <laughs> human beings, you fix it then we're, we're not dealing with another real problem, which is the architecture online. So that's why I, uh, even though I do the research, I'm always adding the cautionary note that this is, yeah, okay, we have to do that. But by the way, the real elephant in the room is the platform. Two-pronged attack, you know, help the people, but also Indeed. fix Indeed. the, the thing that's causing that problem in the first place, the Facebook, the Twitter, uh, Precisely. YouTube, that kind and, of and again, you know, I think... The social, I mean, social Twitter is great. I spend a lot of time on Twitter, but you know, it's a double-edged thing, and we just gotta target the problems uh, without <laughs> getting rid of the good things. And I, that leads incredibly nicely into Serdar's question, which is um, about Twitter. In fact, is it a wise decision to ban Trump from Twitter oh. or removing the pandemic videos? Okay, let me let me deal with the pandemic videos. I was going to say, I think that is two questions, really. Yeah, it's two questions. I'll, I'll, let me start with the pandemic video because I've looked into this a bit. And um, the, the, the answer is, I think, yes, absolutely, it was the right thing to remove that um, because it was blatantly false and complete. I mean, you know, there was just nothing in it. 
that was of any scientific value or had any sort of support. And when people are dying from a virus all around the world, then I think, you know, you just got to say, well, hang on, guys, your freedom of speech stops right there. Uh, once you start killing people with, with your speech, I think society has a right to intervene. And uh, it was very successful because if you look at public interest in the pandemic video as a function of Google Scholar, I, I looked at that. Um, the moment the pandemic video disappeared, it, it dropped into the, I mean, it, it just disappeared, basically. No one cared about the pandemic video once it was removed. Now, there were some people at the time when it was removed who said, oh, that was a bad move because, you know, it, it popped up on the dark web or whatever, some mysterious Mongolian website that with a secret code you could go to and watch the video. Well, so what? It has no consequence. You're never going to stop that. taken off YouTube, it's gone. Don't worry about some website in Siberia that is posting it. And the Google Scholar data sh support that. And as a follow-up, when the second pandemic video came out, uh, which was instantly deplatformed, um, there wasn't even a blip of, of interest in, in Google searches in that video. So deplatforming works. That's the simple fact of life. You, <laughs> if you want to defang somebody toxic, you just remove the platform and the problem is solved. That certainly happened with the pandemic, um, uh, and whether you like it or not. And this is brutal. I'm, I'm, I'm not being a nice guy here. I'm saying, well, if you really want to get something under control, you just keep that form. It works. Now, with Trump, of course, um, uh, well, it worked as well. He, he is no longer setting the agenda. He tried with his blog, which was not his medium. Apparently, no one went there to read it because when he talks for too long, it becomes incredibly tedious. Uh, he can only express himself in 240 characters because he can pack a lot of outrage in that. Um, but if he then goes on for another 10,000 characters, it becomes boring because there's just nothing to back it up. So I think deplatforming him was the right thing to do. Yes, absolutely. Uh, he was, yeah. I would say, you know, we just have to be very careful in how that is used. Because if you start doing that, the second anybody says anything, it's like all of a sudden you're deplatforming the whole world. And of course, of course, absolutely, and that's but in these extremes, indeed, and that is always the problem when when you um, deal with that situation. But don't forget that in Trump's case, it happened after you know years and years and years of him spreading falsehoods without any correction or any interference by Twitter or anything. So, you know, it wasn't just that he popped up and said one wrong thing and then he was deplatformed. I mean, he was deplatformed for denying the outcome of an uh, election and inciting an insurrection. I mean, I think that's, you know, a very uh, uh, a good thing to deplatform people. Like He'd also say, it's not also, he breached the terms and services that he signed. Oh, he, he broke the rules. Oh, of course, he had been doing that for years. Yep. So... You know, I, I think actually, if anything, he was deplatformed. Well, I think he was deplatformed at the right time because I think to some extent, you know, at least now those people who are capable of learning can learn what this type of stuff leads to, which is an insurrection, a violent attempt to overthrow democracy. OK, I mean, let's face it. That's what happened in the United States. And it's not a triviality. Um, so now some people will never learn from that, but those who can learn from it, at least they have that opportunity. So in that sense, he was deplatformed at the right time. Uh, but of course, you're absolutely right. It opens up a serious issue of, of where do you draw the line, and, and uh, of course. Um, so again, sticking with Trump, um, Paul, aka Pictacool, um, asks, how much of your research into the effect of Trump's tweets, etc., can be applied generally, given that the Trump presidency is widely seen as aberration? Ah, very good question. Um, I don't know. I can't answer that based on data. I haven't looked at any other politician's ability to, to divert public attention in, in that way. Now, <clears throat> what I do know is that there is a whole bunch of studies now, dozens, over the last few years that have shown over and over again that exposure to misinformation is, is a causal factor that is driving people's behavior. 
So, um, which is not exactly an answer to your question, but it's 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 close enough, I think, for me to be entitled to say it because it's important. And what it means is that, uh, for example, there was a study last year showing that the more people watched Fox News in the United States, the less they were complying with social distancing and the less they were wearing masks and the more people got infected and the more people died. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a chain. And they were able by a very clever statistical methodology to, to pin that down uh, causally to, to watching Fox News. Um, because of course, Fox News downplayed the, the virus for a very long time. So that matters. It matters to society if, if there is misinformation. And, and that isn't just Trump. It is, it is everywhere. Um, so a question that I think you've already said you kind of don't know the answer to, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and we'll see, where, um, is how does your research apply to the UK government? Do you think they also use untruths to divert attention away from bad news? <laughs> you really do want me to talk about the UK, don't you? I mean, yes, I know. Yeah. I don't blame you. Well, um, okay. <laughs> I, I I actually don't have any published data that, that address that issue. I haven't, to be honest, I haven't done much. I've done some research on, on British participants, but not a hell of a lot. Um, in part, I do that, to be honest, because it's much easier to talk about Americans and, and then the, the blowback isn't quite as close to my front door. Um, but if I put all that aside, then... Uh, <laughs> um, well, I think the British government certainly is, is, is characterized by remarkably little adherence to reality. Uh, I, th I think, you know, um, in, in so many ways uh, that, that it is quite comparable to uh, the US. Um, and it's not just in the UK. I mean, Hungary is another example. Uh, and and uh, I wish there was more daylight between Hungary and the UK than there is at the moment. Um, and I think the, well, this, this opens up a whole big issue of populism. You know, why do people believe politicians like Trump or all the dudes with a weird hairdo? You know, it's the North Korean guy, it's the British guy, it's Trump. I mean, there's something about weird hair that, that makes a politician dodgy. I don't know why that is, but it just seems that way. Um, and, and, and that is why do people buy into that? Well, I think the answer is, in a nutshell, it is that some people are willing to replace honesty with authenticity. The reason Donald Trump was considered to be honest by three quarters of Republicans is because they felt that he was speaking his mind. He was treating himself. He was. he was. He was like a three-year-old having a tantrum. You know, he would just tweet. And talk about Little Rocket Man in North Korea. I have a bigger button than you. you know, I mean, it is kind of like, you know, it's, it, is, it is sort of, I, I can see how people might think that's terrific because it is actually. What makes it worse is he's a three-year-old with however many million followers well, on Twitter. That is the problem. That is the problem. But the, the bottom line of authenticity is something that applies to all populist politicians and they're exploiting it, they're playing it. Uh, Johnson does that in the UK. Trump did it in the US. That Brazilian guy, Bolsonaro, does it yeah. Bolsonaro. I mean, they're all cut from the same cloth, and they're all using the same playbook. And the playbook is to say, "Who, you know, whatever. I'm authentic. I'm a real man. You know, look at me. I'm so powerful. I can do all this. And guess what? I can get away with lying. <laughs> look at the lips over here. They don't like it when I lie. <laughs> I'll lie some more. That is the mechanism. And and. <sighs> You know, and that is what I think is happening in the UK uh, in, in the same way as it did under Trump. Um, now, the, the crucial question is why do people let politicians get away with that? Now, there was a great study done by Oliver Hall about three years ago, which I absolutely love, where they did a laboratory experiment where they were able to turn on and off the appeal of a lying demagogue. And the way they did it was to create a hypothetical scenario in which in one situation, the participants felt that they were excluded from a corrupt system. And in the other condition, they didn't feel excluded and they didn't get the sense the system was corrupt. Now, 
in the condition where they trusted the system, didn't think it was corrupt, they would not pay any attention to the lying demagogue. They would just say, you bugger off, don't talk to me. But in the condition where they felt the system was corrupt, the liar who was playing to their feelings of disenfranchisement and claimed to be an authentic champion of the people, they accepted that. Participants accepted the liar under those circumstances. So the problem we're having with populism at the moment is that this appeal to authenticity and emotion and all the other trappings of populism, you know, the flag waving and the, and the school kids singing songs dressed in blue and red, you know, all that kind of North Korean stuff, that only appeals to people under certain circumstances. And they have to do with, with the feeling either of being left behind or being threatened by outgroups. We know that. Uh, but that doesn't help us terribly much because the political change needed to deal with those problems is precisely prevented by the people who are exploiting it. Very interesting. Um, so we've got a question here from Anonymous. Um, what do you make of mainstream UK conservative political support for the science behind vaccination and climate change compared to the USA? Mm, so, yeah, very interesting. Very interesting question. That is actually uh, fascinating. I don't, you know, I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, other than to say, well, if you look at the UK more carefully, then you will find the same fundamentalist libertarians that are opposing climate science and vaccinations in the UK doing a very similar thing, uh, sorry, in the US, doing a very similar thing in the UK. Um, and of course, there are known connections between think tanks on both sides of the Atlantic, and they're singing from the same sheet and all that. And, and, and as far as vaccination is concerned, you're right, there isn't much conservative opposition to that in, in the UK, uh, at least not on official channels. However, there's a lot of uh, conservative support for this idea of herd immunity that is playing out right now where uh, infections in the United Kingdom are skyrocketing exponentially and in response, the government is, is opening up, saying, oh, yeah, there'll be another 50,000 a day, but never mind. Um, and that is driven by um, the same people who are behind similar attempts in the United States to uh, relax lockdown restrictions and so on. So it's a very good question, but <laughs> yeah. There, there are differences, but there are also similarities between both countries. Yeah, it, 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 we definitely have more of a vaccination. Um, people are happier with vaccination in our government than they are in other parts of the world. They yeah. are pushing it and saying, do it. Well, certainly could, in the US, certainly yeah. in the US. And I was thinking, I, um, it's no different in Europe. I was thinking it's of Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro again. Yeah, I don't know about, I don't know enough about Brazil. I just don't know. Um, okay, we'll move on to um, a completely different train of thought. Um, Parrot Lady asks, is there a way to analyse my own social media data to find out what it says about my personality in a ah. secure, legit way? My yeah. first thought was, how interesting. That is very interesting. Um, okay. Yes and no. Um, uh, uh, Facebook, in response to the Cambridge Analytica scandal, has shut down a lot of access to, to these data. So what we know, we know from before then, when, when the research was done. Um, the list of likes that identifies people as extrovert or introvert is public knowledge. I think that's in an appendix to the UU paper uh, that, I, that I cited. Um, and if it's not in the appendix, it's in an online supplement or something. I've certainly seen the list, let's put it that way. And um, so you could go there and just, you know, look at what you like and compare it to what extroverts and introverts like. And, and then you have a fairly good idea about where you are. But, but ultimately, but, you but, can't get custom data for yourself. There no, is no way to find I, I out. Know of. Not that I know of. Because I know Google have a thing, don't they, where you can find out what Google knows about you and it tells you you enjoy this and you don't enjoy oh, sure. that. Sure. Uh, yes, but that's not exactly your personality. No. 
uh, it's it's probably close. Well, it's not that close. It's it's one step removed from personality. And the crucial thing is that bridge from what you like to your personality. And that's embodied in machine learning algorithms that, um, well, I don't know if any anything publicly accessible at the moment. And the work that has been published, well, as I said, that's archival and you can look up uh, how likes relate to personality. Um, so Nadia um, asks, um, what's your advice in terms of personal social media hygiene to avoid being manipulated? <laughs> well, a uh, very good question. Um, well, first of all, uh, do what Twitter is already nudging you to do, which is don't retweet anything un unless you've got to check, you checked it out. Uh, I think that's a very good uh, measure. You know, I sometimes ret retweet things I know are kosher because they come from highly trusted colleagues and I know what's in the link, so I don't have to read it. Uh, so I sometimes do that. Uh, but generally, I wouldn't tweet or retweet anything unless I've read it and ascertained that it's uh, truthful. Now, when it comes to doing that, there are some interesting hints uh, about how to do that. Um, and there's work by Sam Weinberg at Stanford University, who's discovered that the way, the best way to get to the bottom of a website to, to, to see whether it's trustworthy or not, is to engage in something that's called lateral reading. What does that mean? Well, it means that instead of spending time staring at the website, you spend no time looking at that at all. What you do instead is to open up some other tabs and you start Googling the website and you see what reliable sources have to say about it. Now, if you do that, then if you're looking at a fake website by some think tank or the fossil fuel industry or anti-vaxxers or whatever it is, uh, Google will tell you in 10 seconds flat. Uh, somebody will have will have done the work and said, "Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa! These guys are whatever, you know, some religious sect or some god knows what." Um, so that's the way to do it. You you just um, Google the website you're interested in, and usually you find out in no time. And a linked question to this uh, comes from anonymous. With, uh, do you take any specific actions to stop your own web usage being used to profile you, or do you just accept it's going to happen? Well, uh, <laughs> that's a very good question as well. Uh, I accept it's going to happen more than anything else. Uh, I'm because it's a double-edged thing. I mean, the whole micro-targeting is terrible when it comes to uh, political messages. There's no question because it's it, it it drives political discourse underground into manipulation, away from public debate. That's terrible. But if I go to Amazon and I want to buy a book and Amazon knows me or remembers me and tells me what else I've bought recently that's related to this and suggests books to me. Hey, that's great. I love it. It's always so good. I'm always tempted to buy more than I can possibly read because they're so good at recommending things. So it's a very, it's a Jekyll and Hyde thing. Yeah. Uh, and the same with cookies and all that stuff. Uh, to be honest, I always accept all the cookies because they'll track me anyhow. Even if I say no, somebody will sell my attention somewhere else. Um, so I don't, I don't, I'm not terribly concerned about that because the convenience overrides the problem. Where I draw the line is is when it comes to political messages. And that again is something that I think has to be solved by by regulation. And incidentally, I published a paper uh, uh, earlier this year with people from the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, where we looked at public attitudes in the UK, the US, and Germany towards customization and micro-targeting. And what we found was, was three things. Number one, the countries didn't differ much from each other, except that Americans generally were more relaxed than Germans about privacy, and the UK was sort of in the middle, as it always is. Um, <clears throat> number one. Number two, there was no polarization across political lines, which is amazing. People of both stripes agreed on everything. And the third thing is that what they agreed on is that personalization is permissible for dinner, movies, <laughs> romantic partners. Everybody's okay with that now. We're, we're now at that stage in, in history, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but not politics. 
political messages people refuse to have customized based on their personal data. So people are quite smart, I think, about that. Um, Grimbeard asks, um, I love your 2015 paper in which you analyze the attacks mm -hmm. made on your research. Mm -hmm. Are you still mm -hmm. facing similar attacks or have they gone away or changed tactics? Um, they've pretty much gone away. Um, Do you want to just quickly go into what the paper was? Yeah, before? yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a very interesting paper. Actually, there's another chapter that came out in 2020 where I describe the entire experience. I was asked to do that, sort of like an autobiographical thing. You know, this is my story. That's what happened to me, a show and tell thing. I was asked to write that chapter for, for a volume in conspiracy theories. Um, and so basically, yeah, what happened was that I wrote a paper in 2013, I think that linked climate denial to conspiratorial thinking. Now, there's, you know, honestly, there's no question that there's yeah. a linkage. You just, all you got to do is that. I mean, it's like, come on. But some people on the internet got very upset. Um, the people who were conspiratorial in nature. And so to make a very long story short, basically, they, I became the focus of Oh, you know, complaints, attacks, hate mail, death threats. You know, I mean, I didn't take the death threat seriously, but, you know, that sort of stuff. And, uh, uh, yeah, that, that kept me occupied and wasted a lot of time for a couple of years. Um, and then, as I said, you know, there's a big story there. It's all in that paper. It's also in the chapter I wrote about it. It's kind of fascinating, I guess, but also very tedious because, um, you know, it's just wasted everybody's time. Um, but no, that's, that's, they've gone away. And I don't think that's coincidence. I think that is because in large part, that is, I'm not saying it's organized, but it is certainly not random and entirely stupid. I think these attacks are fairly well aimed at people who might be vulnerable. And my colleagues, all my colleagues who've gone through that, once it became clear that they wouldn't go away, and once they became, you know, sort of visible in, pu in public because they, you know, they appeared on TV and all that, um, that's when the attack stopped because the people who do them thought, oh, yeah, that's a waste of time. We're not going to get this guy down. And so they walk away and find another target. That's what I think is happening. So if anybody is out there in that zone, of being attacked, um, I I would be prepared to believe that if they just keep going and become sufficiently well known, uh, and and it becomes sufficiently clear that they won't be silenced, that then the attacks will stop. That's certainly what happened to me and my colleagues. Very interesting. Um, Chromium fifty two asks, um, how do we know the reduction of Rus uh, the Russia Mueller coverage the next day as the result of Trump's tweets mm -hmm. rather than the twenty four hour news cycle media moving? Yeah, out? yeah, very good question. Uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the first reason is what I sort of hinted at constantly, but didn't really explain, and that is that we have these control variables in there. Um, so what that means is that. Uh, these control variables pick up statistical variation due to, you know, uh, the week of the year, the, the time trend over time, you know, just because history moves on, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we had a hundred of these variables in there to control for precisely that effect. Now, that is, is only part of the answer. The other reason we think it isn't that is because uh, it didn't occur anywhere else. So I already showed you the economy and the gardening and skiing and this and that. There was no effect visible at all, even though the news cycle might have been identical there. Now, you can make the argument that maybe gardening and Russia Mueller operate on different cycles. You know, maybe gardening isn't quite that time intensive, you know, that, that something has to be reported the next day. Um, but another control case we had in there, which I didn't mention, uh, was Brexit. We looked at the Brexit coverage in the New York Times uh, and related that to Donald Trump's tweets. Now, Brexit was very similar to Russia Mueller in terms of the ongoing coverage. Uh, it was ongoing. It was political. It was important. It had major pickup in the American media. But 
it didn't threaten Trump. Quite on the contrary, I mean, he was hooked into that whole infrastructure of uh, uh, these Brexit supporting think tanks and all that. Um, so he didn't consider it to be a threat. And for Brexit, we find no such relationship. It's just a random blob in the middle, as with gardening and everything else. Um, so to answer the question, you, you put all of that together and then you figure, well, you know, could it be the news cycle? Yeah, OK, maybe. But really? <laughs> so what I'm saying here is that it's an argument for plausibility. It is not watertight. I, I, uh, uh, there's very little that's watertight in observational data. Um, the best you can do is look at all these other things and say, well, look, it's not showing here. It's not showing here. It's Try to take out all the confounding factors. Think, well, maybe it's real. Um, Anonymous asks, um, have you looked at what Trump tweets the covert bot re bots repeated? E.g., are they deliberately paying to amplify the diversionary tweets? Uh, no, it's a short answer. Here. No, I haven't looked at that. But it's very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, but I don't, I don't have an answer. Okay, um, Igor has another question, which is, what do you think comes first? Grifters exploiting vulnerable people who can't recognize lies or people believing weirdest things? Well, I think, again, it's an interaction. I mean, I think we know who is susceptible to um, lies more than others. And so, for example, people who think that their intuition is, is a better way to get to the truth than evidence, you know. And there are people who say, hey, my gut feeling, that is much more important for me to know what's true than your scientific evidence. Um, I mean, those people are susceptible to being lied to because if you speak to their intuition and make their gut feel right, then they will say, yeah, that has to be true. Um, <laughs> But, but I mean, you know, it's an interaction. It's it's it, there is a vulnerability, and then there are the people exploiting that. Um, and to say which comes first, well, that's I don't think you can you can say that it takes both. If if there weren't any lying demagogues out there, then a person thinking intuition is is great uh, doesn't have any consequences. And yeah. that was the case for I would argue decades after World War II, where these lying demagogues did not find the same traction. They always exist, they always try, but they were laughed out of town. Um, we, uh, we're going to try and wrap it up fairly shortly, so we'll go with a couple more questions. So we've got Sirdar asks, um, the climate change and evolutionary denialism um, are very similar against science. Why do climate deniers seem to hold more disposition into conspiracy theories? Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I think generally conspiracy theories are the antithesis of uh, science um, because the defining characteristic almost of a conspiracy theorist is that they seek to confirm their hypotheses and not test them. What a scientist does is to test their hypotheses. They're not out to confirm them. Now, of course, <laughs> having said that, yeah, sure, if I run an experiment, I'm pleased if my hypotheses are confirmed. Um, but I'm not gonna, but if they're not, then I will take note of that. And I am not gonna say, oh, well, you know. And it uh, can lead to more interesting science. Exactly, your, exactly. Your hypothesis is proven wrong. Oh, well, what is going exactly. on? Exactly, precisely. And, and with a conspiracy theorist, in a nutshell, that never happens. And, I, I, and so, hmm. I was going to say, I love how physicists love the idea of proving something wrong because it means there's new science out there. Of stuff course. They didn't know before. Of course. And there's always a young scientist who wants to falsify the theory of some, you know, uh, male, pale and stale older <laughs> colleague. And, and they take great delight in, in tearing things apart. So the scientific community as a whole, I think, differs from a community of conspiracy theorists because of that mutual uh, 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 checking and, and falsification. And that's completely absent in, in uh, conspiracy theorizing. Uh, so last question, we'll go with one from an anonymous, which is, are there personality types that are more susceptible to conspiratorial thinking and denial of reality? And how do we educate people in schools to counteract that? 
<laughs> uh, yes, uh, there are certainly individual characteristics that predict um, whether somebody is susceptible to conspiracy theories. And one of the things I mentioned is, is intuitive thinking. I mean, when, you know, whatever you want to call that, there are different names for this, but I, I call it intuitive thinking. Um, people who think that the truth is something to be felt rather than to be tested through evidence, if people say that, they're quite possibly susceptible to conspiracy theories. And, and it goes on, you know, there's a list of things, but they're all sort of in this cluster of you know, magical thinking, uh, into reliance on intuition, you know, it is, it is that cluster of attitudes, and that does predict pretty well whether people are susceptible to conspiracy theories. Now, the second part of the question about uh, training or schooling or getting, wow, that's very tough. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's very difficult to teach people in school that their intuition counts for nothing. Um, you know, that's a tough thing to do. If, if you know, you talk to an eight-year-old who really believes this, and <laughs> what are you going to tell them? Oh, well, actually, mate, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree. You should look at evidence. That's a tough, tough ask. Now, of course, you know, good educators and good programs in schools can, can counteract a lot of this by kind of saying, hey, you know, intuition is great, but it can also mislead you. And that's why we have the scientific method. Isn't that interesting? Come, let's build a volcano or something. You know, you can get people interested in science, um, but that's a very long-term process and it takes a lot of commitment to education and a lot of money. And, you know, let's face it, in the UK, in the US, that's not something uh, that's happening right now, I don't think. It's just sort of insert my own part here as well. What are your thoughts on critical thinking skills being taught in schools? Well, it sounds great, doesn't it? Um, and... Of course, we do that in university, and and for some students, it's extremely successful, and they become really good at this, and it's it's just really enjoyable to see that happening. Um, but the problem is that if you don't do it right, or if the students don't get it, then to them, critical thinking can become just a dismissal of everything. You know, I'm a critical thinker; I don't believe anything, and and. And that's a real problem. And I sort of see signs of that in essays, you know, when they find fault where there are no faults. But they're so committed to critical thinking that they have to find something. So they just make it up. Well, they don't make it up, but they, they say that's a real problem. And in fact, it's not a problem at all. Um, so it's a very, very difficult thing to teach people. And I'm all in favor of it, but I don't think we have really found a way to do this yet. That is perfect. Um, there is one more question that I'm uh, going to use my powers as host and take <laughs> away from you and answer myself, uh, which is that could you confirm that it is indeed coming home? And yes, I can <laughs> confirm that it is coming home. <laughs> um, and on that beautiful note, um, I'd like to say a massive thank you to Stefan. And I would also like to say thank you to James for being my backup and for managing the Slido. Also, a big thanks to Laurie and Igor for all their technical wizardry behind the scenes. Um, although there is no talk next week, we will still be hosting our virtual pub, The Lock-In's Razor, uh, which we will open the door to in a few minutes as well for tonight, uh, which will be at sitp.online slash virtual pub. I hope to see you all there or back here in two weeks' time. Mm -hmm. Good night. Ciao.